Hi, hi guys. I'm testing a new um, system to record video, so we'll see how we go. Um, so today, since I know some of you have already started working over your assessment task, um, I'd just like you to consider um, some critics' views in tackling the conversation between those two uh, experts on both Blath and Hughes. So I thought I, I'd record a, hopefully a short video. Uh, I don't want to go over it too much, but there's a couple of foundational truths that you need to... Uh, it's funny that I say the word truth, but anyway, foundational ideas um, that you need to um, incorporate in as a basis of your conversation. And let's get into it. Let's see if I can show you what I got here. Yep. All right. So um, this is a critic's view of her mythologized persona. Um, I have got um, an article called Death is the Dress She Wears, Plath Grand Narrative by Victoria Anderson. It was published in 2007 in Women's Studies. And there is the link for you to read the full article. Uh, I'll post this to Canvas as well so that you can directly just click on it. Now, the, there are four ideas that I drew out of this. Uh, sorry, I should say four questions. Um, and these are the four questions. And I have used the word bias in very broad terms because some of the questions are more just uh, concrete and there's no really you cannot really take sides on it whereas the other one you might argue that are uh, a bit biased so here we go so what distinction can we make between the private and the public domains in Plath poetry now this is a key question that we need to consider and it is totally unbiased um, that distinction between private and public is what hinges um, really in, in terms of the study of this elective, um, this module, I should say. Uh, the elective is a set of poetry, of course. Now, is that distinction necessary for us, the audience, or was it necessary for Plath herself? This is another quick, uh, key question. That's unbiased. Um, it can be said to be biased, though. Because what this critic argues is the role that the audience play um, in terms of allowing Plath to express herself as a poet, not necessarily as a woman, as a person. And her role as a storyteller to entertain that very famous line of that peanut crunching crowd. Um, it is interesting that Plath actually shapes her poetry with that peanut crunching crowd in sight. Uh, can we discern between truth and fiction in Plath poetry? That could be a bias question because from Hugh's perspective, he wants to delineate the truth of Plath as a person quite clearly and away from the fictionalized persona that she presents in her poetry, as you know. And the truth between his side of the story, of life's plot story, um, and what she perceived to be her side, and also what she portrays to the world. So even on her side, there's two aspects to it. There's two layers to it, if you want to say that way. The way that... Um, she perceives her life, which is obviously very differently from Hugh's perspective, but also how she portrays her life to the world, because she is a poet. Okay, so she shapes her poetry to portray her life events in a certain way. Now, the last question is: Does Plus take, take confessional poetry to another level in Aria? Is it biased? If we see from his perspective, yes, she's a bit overreacting, right? That's what he kind of 
makes known to others because in a way he wants to um, take away that uh, blame that people heaped on him and that sense of guilt that people heaped on him over the years. Now let's move on to the next line. Now I've just taken some screenshots from this um, article and I am drawing your attention. The article is like, I don't know, about 20 pages long or so. So I'm drawing your attention to some uh, gems of wisdom that we can draw from this article that will help us tackle our uh, task in a way that is balanced uh, and provided that balanced, balanced perspective on those two critics. Okay, so I'm just going to read what it says and I'm going to go into a couple of ideas. What if then, uh, instead of attempting to separate the work from the life, which life, and by which I come to mean all that is plus, uh, but which does not constitute her literary efforts, appears to include a panoply of voices, not plus. So here the critic is saying, um, can we separate her life from the interpretation of her poetry and that panoply or that variety of voices or multiplicity of voices that surround her work? We really, it's really hard to differentiate between the actual piece of work and what's around it. Okay, One allowed oneself to embrace for once its unity, its composition as a whole, disparate, multifaceted, ever-extended organism of competing voices or truths. It's obviously there's so many voices around her work and so many truths to the work. This is actually, could actually be a, an essay question about truth. What is truth? Okay, um, In terms of Plath and Hughes poetry. Can you differentiate what is the truth in this? No. And that is the whole point. And you need to be able to discuss um, uh, that idea. Now for Plath, it's more than a poet. She is a narrative. And to utilize Benjamin, so he, she's just discussing someone else's words there. She is a narrative and the authority for that narrative was concretized at the moment of her death. She, Plath, is a story. And at the moment of her death, we can see that what she said kind of was true. Okay? That is that authority, that sense of ethos that is provided at her death. It cannot be ignored that the unfolding of the Plath mythology does not so much resemble a macabre contemporary Bill Goose Roman, which you know what it means, that uh, story of coming of age, as Sandra Gilbert would have it in Gilbert, uh, this is another critic, obviously, uh, but something far more similar in both structure and essence, essence to the 18th century epistolary novel. Now. Um, except um, if you have perhaps read uh, Frankenstein or some other novel that's based on um, or J even Jane Eyre, uh, that idea of this epistolary novel. Uh, I've taken this from Britannica.com. I think it's really important to reference um, uh, the work that we find online, especially in this era of remote learning. Now, the epistolary novel is a novel through the medium of letters written by one or more of the characters. So it is the revelation of what's inside of you through a form, the form of letters. Okay, It's originated with Samuel Richardson's Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, in 1740. And that is the story of a servant girl's victorious struggle against her master's attempts to seduce her. It was one of the earliest forms of novel to be developed and remain one of the most popular up to the 19th century. The pistolary novel's reliance on subjective points of view makes it the forerunner of the modern psychological novel. So Plath's style is pretty much based, we know it's confessional, but it's also somewhat based on the epistolary novel. So she is revealing her inner thoughts and perhaps even more so it's revealing her struggles and her struggles against a force that is against her. Now, in this case, we could say uh, uh, that 
you know, the mythological perspective of that male persona, of the patriarchy, uh, that is embodied through both her father at times and her husband at other times. Okay? All right, let's move on to the next one. Um, now, sympathetically portrayed, and in his own words, her inclusion of Hughes' letters is cradled by cautious discussion of the rights and wrongs and whys and wherefores of making public what ought perhaps to be private, which is, if so happens, the very subject of huge Hughes' letters to Alvarez, and which is moreover a considerable part of the controversy by which the Plath legacy may be identified. Now, these, uh, and it talks about her interiority, okay? It says Plath, very interiority, meant that her poems could not be private, even with the, when she intended them to be so. This tension between the private and the public is what characterizes Plath poetry. It is not just confessional poetry, okay? And I've uh, drawn from poets.org to, de to um, define the word confessional poetry or that term. Private experiences with and feelings about death, trauma, depression, and relationships were addressed in this type of poetry, often in an autobiographical manner. It draws from personal experience but maintains a high level of craftsmanship. While the treatment of the poetic self may have been groundbreaking and shocking to some readers, these poets maintain a high level of craftsmanship through their careful attention to and use of prosody. So, through the use of those prosodic techniques um, and those poetic techniques, the po um, it allows the poet to explain fully how he or she felt on the inside and it dispels a lot of myths about a poet's inner life, okay? Because people could actually see what they r truly felt. Um, however, with Plath, we must be careful because she is also constructing a persona. Now, much of what she says probably felt true, uh, but we must not lose sight of the fact that she is a poet. Now, what this critic is saying that what Plath constructed is a work of art. So as a work of art, this is my interpretation of it, the poet uses, this is not from poets.org, so it's my interpretation, the poet uses his poetic license to manipulate the representation of events in order to create this product. I shouldn't have added a quotation mark there because I didn't take that from anywhere. It was just my own idea. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so what I like to say there is that we are looking at events from her perspective and from her as a poet. Okay. So there are events, there's her perspective, and there's also her as a poet. And that, that is a second layer of construction. So what we see in the poem is definitely not truth. Okay. But it's been constructed, constructed artfully um, to present, again, that story, the story of a story of her life. Let's see if I can move on to the next slide. All right, so now another important screenshot, the difficulty of her reading public. Now, the issue here is we are reading this publicly. This is not just for her, for, for, you know, her poems were not written to stay in her house, but they were written for the wider audience. The difficulty um, her reading public has perceived in the transactions between Ted Hughes and her dead wife's body of writing in his failure, a failure to accept that the works occupied a liminal space between the public and private domains. Now, the word liminal is critical here. It is key because it defines what we are dealing with. E liminal means occupying a position at or on both sides of a boundary or, or threshold. So her poems occupy are at the threshold of the public versus the private. Okay? I says, or rather, not that he failed to accept this. So it's talking about 
Ted Hughes here, but precluded some parts of its access to the public domain, either by destroying or otherwise repressing it. So here, the other issue that we have is her original intention was some, somewhat thwarted by Ted's intrusion in her poetry because she died. So he had to put together those poems in Ariel in a certain forms. So there was some sort of censorship there. Please do not use, this, the, use uh, the word censorship in your essay or responses. But he somewhat censored the release of those poems so that he would release the ones that somewhat depicted her life but did not implicate him as the person who precipitated her you know psychological decline into making that decision of committing suicide of course because he wants to wash his hands off it yeah okay in a in an extrapolation of the epistolary theme it might be said that Plath poems were to a significant extent addressed either to Hughes directly or obliquely or if not Hughes then to one of the other characters in the Plath mythology. Can I uh, draw your attention to the word mythology there? So these are real people, but they are also, these people are also mythologized. Okay? The way they are represented is not real, it's not truthful. Okay? That is her mom Aurelia, Plath, Asha Vevel, of course, Otto Plath, and her children. In other words, the poems acted as if they were more or less reproachful letters, something not unlike Le Lettre Portugaise, uh, which is another work. As we know, early extended prose narratives that assume the epistolary form, and which we frequently perceive as pre precursors to the novel proper rather than as part of a literary mode in their own right, effect effectively blur the boundaries between fact and fiction. You must remember this, the blur boundaries between fact and fiction, and this must be included in your assessment. Whatever the facts of Plath's life were, it is nonetheless true that her story became, as her daughter asserts, fictionalized. Now, was this intentional on Plath's part? Perhaps so. And I'm going to prove that with my next slide. Now, this is the ending to that whole article on, um, from this lady, this critic, and it says... It is possible to discern in Plath poetry the story of a story. The story of a story. What an interesting way of portraying this. And if it is, how far can we apply Tom's second point to the unfolding of Plath narrative? The narrative of a narrative. If it were applicable, one could argue that the detective, by the way, there's a long uh, analysis in this um, article, if you're interested, to look at another one of Plath um, poems called The Detective. Um, now, The Detective talks about pretty much uh, two detectives, such as, you know, uh, well-known Sherlock Holmes um, and his, uh, his buddy. And they come in there and pretty much find out that the woman has died, but they cannot find the body. Okay? So that's kind of the story in The Detective. But there's a, a very insightful analysis of it there. And of course, it's not a prescribed text, so you don't have to learn it. Uh, but if you want to go into the article and just read that part, it will be useful for you to see um, what, um, uh, you know, the, the whole um, um, arguments, uh, you know, that this woman put forth uh, hinges upon mostly on the detective. Okay. Uh, so it's, it says, if it were applicable, one could argue that in the detective, what we witness is Plath displaying her short story skill and superiority over her rivals and even her readers by subjecting them to artfully contrived moments of shock and sensational revelation. I love this, these quotes. Um, I would probably use this quote if I were to, you know, to uh, write this assessment task, or I would definitely save it for my essays, because it is in it is so succinctly, you know, summarizes what she's trying to do. That those moments of shock, and on the right hand side there, I wrote, 
are contrived. What's the meaning of contrived? They're, they're deliberately creating a range in an unrealistic or artificial manner. That is just a definition of the word contrived. But it so purposefully describes what um, you know her style. How how did she carry this on? How what sort of style did she use? Um, and why did she use that style? Because she wanted to create uh, something, a world, okay, uh, a perception in her readers of her and of her life. So is that truth? Most definitely not. And the critic continues to argue, which moments are, moreover, hallmarks of the Plath oeuvre? Now, the oeuvre is an artist's complete body of work. This is why people love reading Plath, not because it is, you know, just a revelation of her life. It is not her life. Plath is not her life. Her, her poetry, I should say, it does not faithfully reflect her life. It is a fic fictionalized version of her life. But it is done pur purposefully, perhaps for that peanut crunching crowd and she does that because she wants to be noticed she wrote her poetry in the 1950s and 60s early 60s and we know that women had not gained uh, the literally uh, literary um, equality that they deserved to their male counterparts so and she very much so deserve that but it wasn't she was born in the wrong time frame yes yeah? perhaps we can argue that too perhaps uh, the critic finalizes you know her whole thesis saying we can limit ourselves to the conclusion that in plath hands confession does not necessarily coincide with truth nor death with endings but rather with the art of the storyteller now i really love the inclusion of nor death with endings uh, because, as we know, her death actually was uh, the beginning of her uh, of her literary career, um, and isn't that interesting? How um, what a paradox is that? Um, now, I hope that that was somewhat useful, yeah. uh, and don't forget to use some of these lessons. Uh, for the upcoming assessment task and that is foundational it doesn't matter what poems you you talk about but if you don't get this right um, it's not going to be a very effective piece um, and I think that this article is actually a very good foundation let's say that you are already finished are you able to incorporate this somehow here and there there's a few quotes that you could easily embed um, to further some of uh, your arguments uh, on the either Plath side or Hugh side. Um, but perhaps the Plath expert would benefit from some of these ideas. Um, because this was written by a Plath expert anyway. Um, all right. Um, have a great day. And see you later. <laughs>